some of the words I'm seeing in the chat is uh, curiosity, uh, creative, uh, thinking outside the box. Um, let's see it, that it's critical to an organization, but it can become a buzzword. Uh, excite, exciting, passion. Those are some of the things that you guys have mentioned. So just take a look and see in the chat what other people have shared. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Welcome everybody. It's so great to see uh, everybody in the room. Um, this is familiar to most of you. You've been on this journey with us, but for those of you that are new friends, um, this is what we're calling affectionately an affinity group. And that simply means that we are all linked together by a common interest or purpose. And this affinity group is um, focused on holistic organizations. We'll get a little bit more, well, we'll get a lot into that in a little bit, but we've had three buckets of uh, topics that we've been exploring this year through these affinity groups, policy advocacy, Holistic Organization Today in Coaching and Training. So welcome to the Holistic Organization Affinity Group today. Jennifer will tell you a little bit more about what that means. Thanks, Tahoot. So holistic organizations, um, it comes in many shapes and sizes. So there are lots of different kinds of organizations that are represented across the foundation's portfolios. And we wanted to be able to create a space uh, for organizations that have this type of an affinity to be able to come together, learn from each other, and also explore some things. Uh, in past, in our last convening, we were able to talk about what we feel it, be, believe we have in common. Um, and we heard some things about helping and supporting and uplifting communities, um, engaging in holistic um, strategies, approaches, where we see the whole person, whole family and whole community um, as within our purview. And so one of the things that we notice from in the funding community is sometimes there's silos about the things that you do. And so again, this is an opportunity to come together and explore strategies about how we tell our story, about how we don't see ourselves as divided by different programs or different things that we see ourselves as a whole. So today our theme has been, so the next slide um, is innovation. And by, we're gonna explore that through this metaphor of a wave. And some of you who might have spent time by the water, perhaps choppy water, you might be intimately familiar with how waves work and what waves are. Maybe you're a surfer and you constructed waves many times. Um, perhaps that's not the case. So if, if that's not the case, you'll, you'll catch on and, and we invite you to come along on this water-based water, water -based journey to think about innovation in, the con in a, in a grand, grander context, if you will. So I'm gonna share with you a poem by uh, Judy Brown, and um, it's in the um, Google Drive that I, I believe we're having some uh, links uploaded for that. So feel free, if you're the type of person who needs to hear and read at the same time, go for it. If you like to take things in more auditorily, feel free to close your eyes, stare off into space, do whatever you need to do in order to have this experience and do take away from it whatever feels right at this time. Trough. There is a trough in waves, a low spot where horizon disappears and only sky and water are our company. And there we lose our way unless we rest knowing the wave will bring us to its crest again. There we may drown if we let fear hold us within its grip and shake us side to side and leave us flailing, torn, disoriented. But if we rest there in the trough, our silence, 
being with the low part of the ways, keeping our energy and noticing the shape of things, the flow then alone will bring us to another place where we can see horizon, see the land again, regain our sense of where we are and where we need to swim. Namaste. Thanks, Jennifer. So we talked about the wave analogy and we're talking about innovation. How do these two things connect? How does this even fit together? So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just uh, giving us an orientation to how um, we might wanna look at this. And when we think about the wave, we think about the horizon, it's far away. Maybe if you're looking at me, this gesture of our hand over our eyes, like we can't quite see what's happening, what's coming, but we know something's out there that we know. And then in the way there's an emerging swell, energy is starting to build. Then there's the crest that where the wave is meeting its highest point. And then there's the trough where things sort of dissipate and you know come apart again. And then throughout this process, there's an undertow that's moving energy, uh, water in a different direction. So this space of nature and how this works. And then there's the element of we're going to do it all again. You know, it moves and it changes uh, here today, gone tomorrow. So when we think about innovation, it's very similar. So when we're looking out on the horizon, what's out there? What are the things that we don't even know yet? What are the cutting edge practices um, that futurists and thought leaders might be exploring? And then where there's the swell, we actually have innovative practices. These are the things that we can see that are coming our way and we plan for them because they've, they've gotten some sort of momentum. When we get to the crest, we've implemented the innovation and it's a standard practice for us. This is how we work now. And it's a changed environment for us. And then in the trough, things just disappear. They move away, we stop using them and they you know, find another purpose or they're just recycled, whatever it is. And all the while in this process, there are things or practices or um, different kinds of energies that are pulling us down so that we can't reach our fullest potential. And so this is the life cycle of innovation. Oftentimes we think innovation is just the new practice, but it actually has a cycle of its own. So if you thought of this as the life cycle of innovation and how this can work. So hoping that, that you can hold some space for that when we move forward and are talking to David about holistic organizations. Thank you, Sherry. So we're gonna play today. Today is really a conversation between uh, friends among friends, and it's gonna be kind of a back and forth format. This is a new format that we're trying with you all today. Um, and so as ideas come up for you, questions come up for you, um, feel free to put them in the chat. We've also created a resource for you uh, in the Google Drive. There's a worksheet in there where you can jot um, notes or questions that come up for you as uh, you listen to, to David and I talk about riff off the, these kind of big picture ideas that uh, we've introduced with this wave analogy. So I will uh, let Allison uh, kind of kick us off here with an introduction of David. Yeah, you know, I, I'm excited to introduce David, but my bet is, is that he's probably not a stranger to many of you. Um, Dave, David's been around. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I was laughing because I remember the first time that like David and I sat down and we were talking, it was when he was at the Headwaters Foundation and we were talking about, you know, different strategies to doing equity work. Um, and he stood up and he grabbed 
a whiteboard marker and he just started this like frantic drawing process on the white on the whiteboard and I both miss having like big whiteboard walls and those kinds of interactions because it really has propelled I think the way that our foundation thinks about um, health equity and racial equity and and the work that we do. So David is, I'll, I'll let him really do a good introduction of himself, but is the program director of Vibrant and Equitable Communities at the McKnight Foundation, um, working towards the goal of building a vibrant future for all Minnesotans with shared power, prosperity, and participation. And I know that all of those words were very intentional, so I wanted to make sure that I said them all. Um, you know, so I think we talk a lot about what a more equitable future, what does collective liberation look like, and how do we imagine that future for, you know, for our children um, in the early childhood space, but for, you know, generations to come in all of the work that we do. So I'm super excited to hear what David has to say about how we can do that work together. Um, before coming to McKnight, he was at the Headwaters Foundation, but just has a long history of doing grassroots movement building work, community change work. So um, yeah, I, I'm just excited to hear what David has to say. Um, we're gonna hear from him first. We'll have that conversation um, back and forth and, and questions for all of you. Um, the, the worksheet is very beautiful also, so I recommend pulling that up and um, uh, noting questions that you have for David as he's talking. And let me know if you have any trouble with it. We can put a direct link to it in the chat as well. Yeah, thank you, Allison. Welcome, David. It's good to see you. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, so we have a few minutes uh, to kind of riff on some pretty heady topics. And my job is to try to keep this conversation steered in the right direction. So you got to help me out. <laughs> we'll do this together. Um, so I would love to, I know you probably know a lot of the people in the room, but I would love for you to, to just introduce yourself, the work that you've been doing over the past several years, um, and a little bit about how you came into your current role with McKnight. Yeah, um, so first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for um, sharing this time with me. As I also said, I think this would be much better if we were together with a whiteboard and I really look at, I don't really like these dialogues. I was sitting here pretty embarrassed going like, geez, now I'm on center screen <laughs> and I'm more of a riffing with people. So I hope that you take opportunity to do chats, interrupt, cause this is really your time. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, just a little bit about me, as you said uh, to who to, um, I've been around, and that was Allison that said, I've been around. So I've been working for 30 years professionally, and I think what's important in this conversation is just the varied sort of uh, backgrounds. Most of the places I've worked with, I've worked as for a decade or so. So I started my work with uh, Runaway and Homeless Youth at an organization in St. Paul called Andai Young. And that's significant. We'll talk later about organizations, but again, it was a smaller culturally based organization where the values were deeply infused, both traditional values and also um, organizational values um, that were reflective of the community. Then I went to work at the uh, state of Minnesota at the Department of Children, Family and Learning. Again, a very different organization. It had its own culture, its own values and its own sort of um, system and way of doing things. But basically it was a large organization. Bureaucratic would be one of the ways we'd wanna think about it. From then I went to um, Headwaters Foundation for Justice. Again, a smaller, you know, I think of it as a nonprofit, it is a foundation, but it was a smaller organization where, where we were really focused around um, central values around culture, um, central, central values that, that were around equity and justice that were both what we did and how we did it, which is important in our conversation later, and then um, the latest for a year and really 30 days, I've been at the <laughs> McKnight Foundation. Um, so I've been sort of a gambit of organizations. McKnight Foundation's about 50 people. And um, so there's been lots of, different, um, lots of different experiences to go by and also been board member for a number of places. So I come to you uh, with a lot of experience of how not to do things. <laughs> I'm deeply an optimist, which means I believe that we can make things better. I'm also a pragmatist, which means I live in this world. 
trying to make it better. And so I'm mm -hmm. excited to be with you all today to have that conversation and see what we can learn from each other. Beautiful. Um, and yes, we would, this would be so much more fun out in the park under the sun, kind of picnic style riffing. Uh, but you know, here we are, so we can still make magic happen uh, in this virtual space. So one of the things that I think uh, Jennifer kind of intimated this that we've noticed as evaluators working in the community is just this tension that organizations often find themselves caught up in, where they look at their communities as whole units. You know, we, we, we care about education, we care about your health, we care about what's going on in the home, but the funders that they engage don't necessarily think in those same ways. And they have a harder time kind of telling their story, which is where we kind of um, are able to assist sometimes in helping create a, a more comprehensive, holistic story of their work. We hear them with uh, having trouble with, with funding sources, et cetera. So this topic of a holistic organization is really, it's not just about, uh, there, there's so many challenges that come with moving through the world in this way, serving people in this way. Um, so when we say holistic organization, what comes to mind for you? What do you think about these kinds of organizations and, and their vision for how they want to serve their communities? Yeah, I mean, I think we'll talk about sort of the funder's perspective down the road. I think there's an interesting piece in that. But, you know, to answer your question about holistic organization, when I saw this, some of the things that came to my mind, and I think, I think this is part of the conversation we're going to have today, is that it's a struggle. Um, if I think about holistic organizations, I think about organizations that are good for people, that are good for their mission, which means they're purpose-driven, and that they're good organizations so that they're actually run well. So that's in finance and administration. And in and of those self, just those three things are sometimes con conflicting. And I think that's where, at least in the various places I've worked, it's working through those, those conflicting sort of what's good for is I think the struggle as organizational leaders or you know, people in organizations that we actually are struggling with. Mm -hmm. And I think this question that you brought up about you know, funders viewing this, if we think about funders, we're just one stakeholder. We do have a particular vantage point and particular interest. And so sometimes communicating both the beauty of, of the struggle that you're in and how you're trying to uh, work through those. I think, I, think what, I, think the, I think the challenge for people is that they think of funders as somebody other, they, they, they have some misconception about both their power and their importance. And so I think it's hard, harder for people to be vulnerable and talk about the struggles they're having in trying to meet those 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 three sometimes conflicting and intersecting um, uh, you know mm -hmm. missions or purposes. Um, so I think that's that's part of it right there. But I would love to hear from others because you all are in the midst of that. Um, that's certainly my perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe put in the chat, uh, friends. Like, what are some of the struggles that you've encountered over the years as you've tried to move through the world in a more holistic manner? Um, so I've sort of st stolen the thunder talking about funding streams, but what other challenges have you, have you bumped up against as you've worked in this way? Go ahead and put those in the chat or come off mute and share with us if you feel comfortable. Um, I want to ask you about, so we talked about this wave analogy and the, we want to start with the crest, which is really standard practice. This is where we are right now, kind of the current state of things. So it goes without saying that we're, you know, contending with so much right now, um, so many things, I won't even attempt to list them off, but we are sort of in this weird vortex of a, of a moment in time where everything is being kind of re-examined, questioned, um, dismantled perhaps. Given the state that we're in, what are some of the advantages of being a holistic organization, of moving through the world in this way at this time? What are some of the advantages that you see? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think we can't under um, emphasize this moment we're in. So again, organizations, people, we're all in this both amazing and frightful moment. And I say frightful partly because of, you know, to me, I see this as a moment of intersecting 
opportunities. If we look forward, we have the opportunity of figuring out climate change <laughs> really soon. The moment we're in right now with the pandemic, it reminds us of both the vulnerability that we have and also the, in the inequality that exists in our society. And the racial reckoning, I'm not saying that it's in the past, but it reminds us of, all, of both the historical choices to include, exclude, deny people. So we're in this moment. So I think, you know, back to your question, I think, you know, I think this moment is calling all of us to reimagine and rethink about how we've organized ourselves historically. I mean, I really appreciated how you talked about organizations. If we think back, most of the organizations, the basic structure of the organizations that we are in are really from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, talk about talk about needing a bit of a facelift. Um, I, you know, so I think we're in a moment where we're seeing sort of um, the limitations of the various structures that we're in, and organizations are just one of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think this moment is helping us, you know, all see kind of the, the limitations, the cracks, the you know, the things that need to be fixed. And I think that's, a, I think so that, back to your question, I think what's exciting about this is that in this moment, we can't stand still, we have to move forward. So I think the status quo or the crest, as you call it, um, is the place that reminds us that we have to look further than the horizon because what, what's required of us is very different vehicles, uh, very different ways of being in relationship than we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm always, I'm, I, I love what you just said. And I'm always struck by, I have moments where I'm struck by this, in some ways, the delay, most certainly the delay in the, the change, but also the speed, you know, it's like a holy instant where now it's like that no longer works. You got to do better. You got to figure something out. And we see a lot of organizations like trying to play catch up and trying to figure out like how to reimagine themselves rather quickly. So it feels like it's both late, very late, but also like you're late now, you got to move, you got to reimagine yourself quickly. It's a very, it's a very strange time in some ways and also exciting. So there's some comments in the chat. Um, Nashina says, besides funding radical change, would love to see philanthropy fund radical rest that we need to do in order to do the radical change that we're trying to bring about. And Claire um, said, holistic sometimes is misinterpreted by people as unfocused or spread too thin. Um, and a friend in UCAP says many, many agencies exist within these regulatory environments that were probably stood up in the 1950s under a very different paradigm that really impede true holistic approaches for people. So those are, um, again, kind of like outdated, these outdated systems that you mentioned um, that are, are, are interfering. Let, let, let's talk about that for a second, because yeah. I think, you know, so the question, right, if we're, if we're, if we're excited and thinking about what is really on the horizon in, you know, in the, the metaphor they're using with the wave, you know, we're imagining places that we would, we would come together, either if it's for work or for social environments, these things called organizations that are places of our own liberation that we can collectively do much more together. And that, you know, that they're sort of the vehicles for actually transforming the world, right? Mm -hmm. So then what are the what are the constraining factors and how do we switch them from constraining factors to, to sort of opportunities? And I mean, if you think about organizations, again, I'm gonna be all, I wish, when I talked about innovation, I thought, yeah, that's not me, I need to. <laughs> Maybe that was back when my hair was a lot <laughs> farther down here. It used to be here, really. I'll tell you. It was a time. Um, but, you know, if you think about some of the things, the questions in my mind is what are the what are the apparatuses that we've put in that actually keep us from moving forward faster, as you talked about, too? You know, and some of those is really, if we think about this from a sense of governance, right, these it's a it, governance is the body that's supposed to help us think about the strategic vision and help us think about what is it that we need to achieve what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So the question is that is the governance we have in whatever, if we're talking organizations, if we're talking about a social group, the people that are supposed to think about that, 
Are they really looking far enough out there? And are they making sure that they have the resources that we need to be able to do that? Nishina, your point about, about holistic rest, or I mean, your, whole, your point about rest is a really important one. I'll get back to a minute. But another, so if we think about another sort of potential uh, body for either limitations or for moving us forward is, you know, is it, if, so if you think about administration, right? These are the folks who are tasked, which I am one of them, right? Who are tasked to ensure that we understand our goals, missions, and values, and then can achieve them in that work. <clears throat> the question that we need to be asking ourselves in these two bodies, and there's one more, I'll, I'll name it right now, which is organizational or group culture. And really in my mind, that's really both the informal and formal rules that we've all agreed sometimes are policies and practices, but this is what we've agreed to do. So the question at the beginning of this is, are these constraining entities um, ready for the moment we're in to help us see going forward? Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, back to Nishina's point, you know, one of the things that saved me in my work, both at Onda Young and at Headwaters was a sabbatical, mm. was a policy that was put in place. And now, you know, I'll just have to be honest. If my daughter was here, it was like, well, how can we did, wait it so long to take it? Because <laughs> I did, I almost waited two sabbaticals because that, that's there's another piece to this about people that are drawn to this work. We can talk about that. But, um, but the sabbatical helped me to step back and get away from the work for a moment and try and look at taking care of myself. Mm. And, you know, this is another sort of thing. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to, I'll let you ask me questions. I can no, just, no, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. Well, I think there's another piece that we need to look at is who's drawn to this work mm. to work in holistic organizations. And so I think at some level, what I've been thinking about when I've been in the governance and in the administrative role or in the role of trying to hold culture which is recognizing that the people that are drawn to this work are so committed to taking care of the world, they'll do it at the expense mm. of themselves. Mm. So we have to think about how do we put in place systems so people slow down and take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. But, and it's hard, it's hard because again, you know, this moment is calling us to do so much more. I know for me, and yet we have to take care of ourselves. So. I'll stop there. I know you have lots of questions for me and there's probably more in there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, that deeply resonates as I think about my early days as a mother and coming from a culture in a country that, you know, the mother doesn't do much of anything for, you know, at least 30, 40 days and you have family and friends that are deeply, deeply supporting you. It was uh, kind of shocking to see how outdated the policies were around family leave for, for women and how even the unpaid six weeks were hard fought to get. So yeah, there's, unless it's baked into the way we do work that you rest and that you take care of yourself and that you have access to food, et cetera, then some of us will default to always being in service um, until we sort of have a health crisis and, and, and break down because it's not baked in in our structures, in our environments. Well, and I think that's the exciting thing about this moment from a society's perspective, is I think we're starting to renegotiate the social contract. I mean, you talked about something, you know, parental leave in a real sense. If you look at any other sort of, uh, you know, any other smart society, I won't talk about the development undeveloped, but any other smart society recognizes that the family unit at that particular transition is so important that, that the society is gonna support the individual to take right. care of the next generation. That's an investment. Right. So then our organizations then try and work within, you know, right now in crazy limitations of the social contract that exists and then does what it can to try and help individuals. And that's where you come up with, you know, a week off, mm -hmm. six weeks <laughs> unpaid, Things that, things that just make it harder, make the choices. We've pushed down the choices to individuals right. and organizations right. rather than having them as society. Sorry, this is probably, I don't know if this yeah. is where you want to go, but right. as Allison will tell you, this, yeah, I have a tendency to go wherever it seems to end up. Well, a lot of the yeah. undertow is related to these things that you're mentioning. A lot of what's keeping us, pulling us down and keeping us behind are in some, in, in a lot of 
respects these systems and these structures and these outdated policies, which a lot of our partners on the call are working at that systems level to try to dismantle some of those things, but um, strong undertoes for sure. Jennifer, are you gonna say something? I was gonna say that uh, Gilbert has a, interest, or has a question uh, mm -hmm. that's come up that might, might be t a timely or topical. Um, as we're talking about the multiple constraints that produce this mis mismatch, um, you can read it for yourself, but, um, but then what is your analysis of the alignment between the talent needed to do this work and the existing leadership within organizations? Maybe a little bit about our current state, maybe a little bit about the undertow. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, that's a, Gilbert, you're the best. <laughs> that's the <laughs> hardest questions I'm now. Now you got me sweating and everything. I'm like, I don't know. I think that's a good one. I think that's something for us all to kind of ponder. I think this is really the challenge of our moment um, is really embedded in that. I think there's another thing that we have to recognize of our own culpability, which is what is it in our minds that feel that it's somebody else's power or agency to define things? You know, even this concept of constraints that I put in there, oftentimes, this I find more often than not, I found it in particularly working at the state, the larger the organization, when I worked at the state, it was endemic where, you know, for some reason. So again, I think this question that we need to be thinking about, what is our agency and how do we create environments, organizations, family structures, relationships that deeply empower people to have their agency and then manifest that out. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that's been a lifelong struggle of my mind. My children will tell you good, bad, and ugly dad um, <laughs> and doing that. But 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 I think that that it, that it's one of the biggest constraints that I find is people, you know, forgetting the reality that we made this whole society up. We created it in some level and we're continuing to uh, reinforce it in the ways that we do. So I think that's one of the biggest constraints is our own constraint of imagination. Mm. Because, you know, I mean, you know, some of these things, policies, practices, and all these other things are, again, we can change these. They're not written in stone. Somebody didn't make them up. They're hard, it's hard sometimes, but, but that's the first thing. That's the first biggest constraint. Mm. So I have a follow-up question to, the, to that comment because I think a lot of what impedes um, innovation within organizations and even maybe perhaps within government and funding is risk, discomfort with risk and how we conceptualize failure and loss. So if I put out $100,000 into a project that, you know, there's a lot of strings attached to that money, right? So I'm, I have an expectation that you're going to do X, Y, and Z. And until I see it, I'm not going to be able to decide whether that was a failure or success versus we're going to fail till we get it right. So this investment over time is, it is like an investment in your retirement, which I haven't done, you know, cause that's like, I'm like, what, who needs to do that? Right. So, but that's kind of delayed gratification. That's off somewhere in the abstract future. I may or may not ever see the, that money. So it's harder for people to be comfortable with heavy investments with a delayed payoff in a way and, and risk. So how do you, I'm going to put you in the hot seat and, and ask you as a funder, mm -hmm. how do you think about because to innovate, you have to be willing to fail and failure t takes money, right? Like you have to fund failure for a while before you see success. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm probably the worst person to talk about risk because I don't actually think, I mean, you know, so I mean, I think like on some level, right? If you think about all of the resources that are causing the problems that we're hoping to do, I mean, any amount of money that we can put towards this is like, it's, it's small. So the question though, cause I just had this conversation today where somebody earlier this morning was actually talking to me some about a project. And I was like, just so you know, there's no foundation that would ever touch that. Never, mm. we're not doing that. They're not ever gonna do that. So I think part of it is getting real about what matters to certain funders. So again, you know, I mean, if we're talking about risk, right? So nobody wants to invest in something that's kind of a hot mess. I mean, if, it, if your books aren't good, if you haven't been able to produce results, whatever those results are, 
You should be able to define those. No one's going to invest in it. No one is. And that's not about a funder and risk. That's just about smart. Would you do it? No. So, um, however, now, I think the question that you're really getting at, and I don't want to be flipped because I know there's a lot of people here that have, have really great ideas and funders, uh, individuals, whoever, supporters, haven't invested in that. And I think what I would ask people to do is interrogate with whoever that person is and say, like, what is it that they see risky? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Is it about, because oftentimes in people's mind, in funders, we'll just say, okay, right? so in funders or individuals who have control of whatever resources, in their mind, they have preconceived ideas. Part of the work is unpacking that and understanding where they're coming from so you can help them shift from risk to opportunity. Um, you know, I, I got a great story on this. Uh, well, anyway, I don't want to go off on stories. I want to be able to <laughs> have this focus for people. But the, but the point is, it's for me, the flipping that from risk to opportunity. What The question isn't about what is the risk of this? It's really what is the opportunity or what is the risk if we don't invest in it? Mm. <clears throat> mm. Uh, like I said, I'm not maybe your typical funder, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, oh, do I hear your voice? This is Sue. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Sue, we can, can hear you. Can jump in? And, so I saw that Jonathan had put that piece about the agencies and the, so I, and I think part of the thing, um, we all, we work with the same agency, totally different programs. Part of the thing I think that we struggle with is um, we all have, you worked at CFS. So that's the department that funds my, my work, right? Um, you know, the complications of government funding and strings, and you can only do these certain things, but then we have these innovative ideas, which is why we um, reached out to Blue Cross Blue Shield and other foundations to kind of help us bring that together. And I, so I think when we're, our aim at, I know at our agency is really trying to do two gen work, or I would say three gen work and um, really unite all the different programs that we do and make sure that we're working with them. But then we all have those, those things that you can't do. You can't walk over that line with this grant. You can't, you know, um, cause they're very prescriptive. And so I think that coming up with innovative ideas, I know that the work that's been done, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield has been very um, big in this. And a lot of the organizations around the state, around the friend, family, neighbor was just when things slow down is to keep that voice going so that it does come back. And, and I don't know, I, I think it's like, how do we get innovative? Like, how do we tie those different programs together when those funding streams don't allow us to, and how do we get innovative and how do we work that? I don't know. I mean, maybe you being with all your experience in both the public sector and um, uh, foundations, I think that gives you a good idea of how that could maybe work. Yeah, I mean, I would love to hear from Carolyn, Claire, Allison, and others, but I'll tell you a little bit of what I think, which is part of this is I have a philosophy about what philanthropy or foundations could and should do. And it is exactly what you're talking about. What we should be funding is the research and development for this, for sort of the unlocking the human capacity. The trick is, is that we should be funding it so that it actually uh, demonstrates and proves its point, and then we're able to pick it up as public support. Once we've figured out that it's that it's a good idea, it's a smart investment, we've innovated to the point. The problem for the last 30 years is we haven't publicly supported much. For you know, and that that's on all of us, to be honest. We've let sort of the this world take us by and say, you know, we shouldn't raise taxes, and yet, you know. So we just won't even go there. But that's so if in fact philanthropy can do research and development well, ideally we would be doing that, finding those great ideas. Well, not finding those. You would be telling us to these great ideas that you got, we'd be like, that's a great thing to invest. Let's see if it works. As it works, let's see if it's replicable, let's see if it's scalable. And then let's get it to the public sector because we've did proof, proof of concept. I think that the thing that's been hard for me, you know, again, I'll be honest, like for every dollar, for every grant that we make, I say no to 10 groups. And the problem is, is that there's been such a shift from, you know, people are looking for philanthropy to support the sort of the ongoing support of efforts and not that research and development. So we get caught in the bind of like, we know that your work is important and want to continue to support you and the efforts you're doing. And 
we need an exit ramp so we can have the new innovative stuff. That's the bind that we're in more often than not. And, you know, we do it with our own organizational <laughs> cultures, constraints, challenges, and freedoms. Um, and we do it better or worse, depending on whoever gets money or not. That's, that's a really, <laughs> how well I'm liked is how many people <laughs> I can say yes to. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful or satisfying, but that's what I think. I don't know what Carolyn or Claire or other people who have worked in this field for a while, that's my take. And again, I'm, you know, you're all getting, this is just sort of. Okay. Actually, that makes a lot of sense because I know in the realm that I'm working right now, there is stuff coming down now with some of the new funding around child care. And it is based on the projects that have been happening around the state. Some of those that were funded um, through Blue Cross Blue Shield, some of what I'm working on. Those types of things around capacity building and friendly family neighbor and all that is now coming through the funding stream of the public dollars. And so that makes sense to me now um, in a way, because it's sometimes hard to even put yourself out there to say we're going to try this because it's about hiring staff. And then what if nothing happens with that, then you have to let staff go. And so you're it's just a lot of a lot of worries. And those of us that work in, in this field and you nailed that is that we don't worry about ourselves as much as we worry about the people that we work with and the people that we're trying to serve and so um sometimes there's that that risk and and we worry about that so thank you i think that really helped thanks mm -hmm. so i oh julie put in a i was gonna let's see what julie says is the nonprofit board of directors model still the best structure it's often challenging to recruit board members and specifically difficult to fill the chair position in holistic organizations because it is a lot to take on. The chair has a strong voice in the direction of the organization for their short tenure, and it's often challenging to find someone willing to be innovative. Nonprofit board of directors model. Yeah, I mean, so I think we, 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 we can and should talk a little bit about some of the interesting and innovative sort of practices. I mean, I think currently I'm not on a board right now, and, I, and I'm not necessarily going to be, but the, the, when, when I was recruiting for my board at Headwaters, one of the things that I would talk to protective board members is you can only be on my board. That's the only board you can be on because I'm going to work you hard. <laughs> and it's going to be for six years and then you're done. And we would negotiate actually like, what is it that you're going to get from this experience? Because I'm going to take a lot. I'm going to. That's just the way it is. So I think part of it is, is that I think we, we do need to, you know, have a conversation about boards because I often see people that are on like five boards and I'm like, there's no way you can keep track of that. There's no way. There's no way you can. I, I, I couldn't and I, could, I wouldn't, from what I asked of board members, I don't think they could. So I think we have to kind of think a little bit about what is the size, what's the right people. We also get this sort of management school 101 where it's like, you got to have this kind, you got to have this piece things. And I'm like, you know what? There are some skill sets that are important, but if people don't believe, absolutely believe in the work and what you're trying to do, mm. they, then it's less, I, I just want them to believe as much as I do as the staff or all the staff that are doing this because um, that's what I need, the commitment I need. So I think, I don't know if it's so much the structure. I don't know how to get rid of the structure. I think there's some people that are looking at different governance models, co-ops, uh, sort of collective ownership models. There's some things that are like that similarly in the nonprofit world that we can talk about. But I think what we have to do is with the structure you have, because I'm a pragmatist, we're going to have nonprofit boards. The question is, is how do we think about what their role is? How do we think about what the support that they need and how are you going to make them work? Mm. And again, if you go back to what I said about governance, it's about money. So that's about giving money and getting money. That was one of the things I made people work at. And two is, a, is bringing their thought leadership and their, you know, whatever, whatever piece they had to help contribute to organization. And I would, I would make sure I found it for them because that's what I needed. I needed people that were working for the organization and in a capacity, in that capacity from a governance perspective. So mm -hmm. But it's hard. It's hard too. Mm -hmm. So I want to sending. I'm sending up the 10 minute flare for you guys, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> there's a. If you want to turn any corners, now is a good time to do that. Well, I don't know what corner we're on, but I was. I wanted to stay on this 
on this kind of, I think you're in the emerging swell and this, what should I be doing as a holistic organization? So I want to kind of recap what I heard you say. Funders job is to harvest new ideas, innovations and scale and replicate. And that's in your mind, really kind of what their role in, in the game is. For me, I'm, an, I'm a holistic organization. I'm just starting out. I have my innovation that I want to test and develop. What should I be doing? So you've, you've said a couple of things. You've said lean into agency, develop your own sense of agency and the agency of those around you. Um, you've also talked about you know partner and bring on the right people, like the board. They should really be committed. I'm also hearing you say, stay in relationship for a while, six years. You've talked about in your own work, you're in it for 10 years. What else should I be doing? What are the practices, ideas, things that you see as like, this is, if you do these things, not that there's any guarantee, but what should I be doing if I'm that organization and I'm on the ground and I'm innovating and I'm trying to do all of these things for my community? What else? You know, the sort of the difference that's made a difference for me in organizations. And again, some of these have been very, you know, um, is creating a learning organization. Mm. So it's, it's very funny, right? I'm at McKnight. We actually have a director of learning, Neeraj. He's super smart and he helps us all to learn. And as an organization, when I was at Andai Young, it was a learning organization because it was so lean that you either had to innovate, learn, or you failed, period. You know what I mean? But I think creating, you know, because again, we've all been in places and you kind of, you know, you're, we've all been in organizations or doing efforts and you're looking at the forms or you're looking at the process and you're like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Someone had to find this be a better way of doing this. I know I could if I thought about it. So I think the question that I would be asking all of you is, you know, is how do you instill a, your organization as a learning organization that takes the time to think about what it's doing, both big picture mission, you know, this isn't strategic planning learning, this is, you know, I mean, so again, I'll give you a great example. We're going into a grant round coming up on the 15th, right? October 15th. And what we just spent yesterday or day before yesterday doing was going through a process where we were re reviewing how we did the last one as far as our own procedures, like, and practices. And we, you know, we have sort of a formal process, but we actually reviewed what, what um, our practices were of the last time we made grants to make sure we do a better job process wise. So again, this is the thing that takes time. I feel very fortunate because I'm at a place right now where there's enough resources to be able to take a moment, two, three hours with 10 people to say, I know we've, I know we're smarter than we were four months ago. What did we learn that we can mm. do better this time? So I think that, but I think this is a piece that um, allows you to move from the trough to the crest, if I'm using the analogy correctly, um, is being a learning organization and instilling that. I think that also gives people a lot of agency because then people are like, oh, you know what? If this isn't working, we can talk about it. Well, then this is a place I'll stay because I can, you know, people talk about mm -hmm. constant improvement, but it's a learning organization that, that takes that and moves with it. Mm -hmm. I just want to pull on a string in what you said about learning because um, learning is fluid. It's always changing. You said we're smarter today than we were four months ago. So I may know something now that I did not, it didn't occur to me in the past. Um, on our team, like Jennifer is, is very comfortable with learning and I'm a bit of a robot. You know, I'm like, I just want to know where to park the car. I want to go park the car and go home. That's all I want to do. Stop like switching things on me and telling me like, I got to go park on the other street, you know? So there's some anxiety, I think, around this idea that we're always learning and now we might have to change our ways. Um, can you speak to that at all? Because I feel like that's a very real, re that's re resistance that I think is very common in many organizations. And did my staff like call you and say, ask them why he keeps innovative because it's I, driving us crazy. With all I'm like, I'm tired. I just <laughs> need to part tell me what you want from me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I how do you deal with that? I think, you know, part of it is about habitualizing it. Part of it is about, and this again, is something we are doing with our grantees is like, you know, I mean, again, it's interesting. Right? We're talking about evaluation. We're asking, you know, you all know what you're, what, what's, um, how you know you've been successful and what success looks like. We don't need to tell you that. You just tell us that and we should be able to collect that. So again, part of this is about data. 
right? Finding the data that matters. So I have some folks that are very, um, you know, that liked the routine and feel comfortable with the routine as it was created. Again, there's there's a lot of sense of agency in that. If like I can predict my my week, my year, right. or right. this camera. So part of it is, in, you know, for me, it's about getting them to help me think about how we could make this better because then they're bought into it. So that's part of it. And there's still the, there is still anxiety and there still is that, but you know, I guess I'm really comfortable with it. And so. Um, you, you drag us robots along with you. Got it. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I guess I'm a pain. <laughs> so we have three minutes and I, I love this question because it's so beyond my capacities. I want to just touch on the horizon and we know futurists, they're like these unicorns. So I'm going to ask you, I feel like you're a such unicorn. What do you think will be happening um, that isn't even on our radar? I mean, it's hard to even imagine what else could happen that wasn't on our radar. But as we think about being holistic organizations moving into this uncharted territory, are you seeing anything that you're like, you, we have to pay attention to this thing. We can't do this this way or hold on to this practice or hold on to this mindset. What's coming that we haven't, we're not seeing yet? Well, what you said, what it sparked for me is the thing that wakes me up in the middle of the night, which is, you know, for my 30 years, in all the various uh, work that I've done, we've dealt with a specific scale. It's always been more than we can handle, but you could actually see the end to it. So just to give you an example, right? If you look at homelessness in Minnesota, it's about 100,000 100, people, maybe 50, 60, 70,000 units we need right now you know whatever the whatever the the area of work you're in you're always dealing with the scale but it's it's somewhat reasonable what keeps me up at night is actually the climate change and one just one specific thing right the migration the internal migration the migration of people moving to this amazing place we have in minnesota you know uh, with water away from some of the other um uh, some of the other challenges in the environment. And I just take every scale that I've worked at and add a zero to it. Mm. That's what I'm thinking about. That's the kind of, that's the kind of kick in the butt that I need to say, like, man, whatever we're doing, we got to do it 10 times better because that's what we're going to need mm. in less than a generation. And I think it both scares me enough to move, but it also keeps me from because I'm getting old. I want to be comfortable. I really do. I really want to have a routine. <laughs> I really want to slow down. But I feel this urgency of like, we've mm. only begun to see what where the need is. So I think that's one of the things I would like to leave people with from the futurists is that's why we're doing this innovation, cresting waves, being tumbled along in those waves. If you've ever gotten to the ocean, it's because um, we're preparing ourselves for what our communities need and the, what the needs now are at a at a at a at a, a small level for what they're going to be needing mm. and um so it's a it's a beautiful thing that we're preparing ourselves and our children for mm. thank you any last quest thank you it's always so uh invigorating and like you're so provocative in the way that you think about things and express them. I appreciate that about you. Any last questions from any friends in the room for David? Uh, you can come off mute or put it, we're gonna give you an opportunity to kind of digest this with your peers in a second, but any questions for him? I don't know if you're staying or leaving, but um, any questions? Or you're probably like me kind of taking it in still. Hi, this is Ronnell Robinson, and you know I know I've really valued one of the things that our CEO has done is just like a couple times a year we'll we'll gather with staff and managers and really just brainstorm and look at what is working, what's shifting, what's you know unknown. You know, look at these scenarios and just kind of create options based on those. I thought that was just one of the, the best pieces that we could do. And as, you know, mm -hmm. sit in this place of, yeah, we know what's core, we know what's important. It is just trying to look at, okay, so how would we do something differently? How would we 
um, be creative in the work that we do and the work we do with partners and the work we do mm -hmm. with funders and, you know, you know, as funders are shifting as well in terms of their direction and their mission and their, you know, what they're going to, what they're going to pay for. So it, it is just trying to look at some of those scenarios. So like I said, I know we have a planning session coming up in November and I look forward to it because it is, even if it's on a Zoom whiteboard, um, <laughs> just getting to throw out ideas. And even as we do our budgets for next year, she's like, well, put your wish list on there and we'll see what we can do in reality. So I just wanted to share that before I jump off and go into the next session. But yeah, taking a sabbatical, it's like, I have so much PTO time right now. And it's like, mm -hmm. if I take a day off, I've already worked more hours than I needed to in a week. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that'd be nice to take a whole week off. Mm. A week, <laughs> you should take a month off. A month off, I just can't do that, but yeah. Okay. Well, good to see everybody. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Everybody take care. Thank you for being here. Any other parting questions? I think I'm going to kick it over to, thank you, David. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to kick it over to Sherry. I think she's going to take us to our next activity. Yes, our next activity. Thank you, David. And I just want to say I'm glad we're recording this because I feel like I can go back and re-listen and jot down some more things for sure. So we're going to have a small group conversation to give us all an opportunity to um, have a deeper conversation about the experience that we just had uh, for um, the day and especially uh, David's conversation. And we have a worksheet in the, in the Google Drive and that small group worksheet is in the file name and the questions are on that worksheet for you. We'll, spend, we'll give you about 20 minutes and then have you come back and report out. You're gonna assign a facilitator. Um, they're gonna make sure everybody has a chance to introduce themselves and lead the group through the questions. Um, I, I guess I would also ask everybody to be mindful that we're all responsible for making sure all the voices can be heard in the room. That would be great as, uh, even as participants. You're gonna assign a recorder and the recorder is going to collect the last question in the um, fillable PDF that we sent you and bring that back to the large group. And so we're asking the reporter to bring that last question back, put it in the chat and also speak to it and share it with the group as a whole. And we're just gonna break into uh, random groups. Maybe I'll be some new folks for you to meet or you'll see some familiar faces. Everybody is jumping back now. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, welcome, welcome back. back. Hey, welcome Bo, back. I haven't seen you for a while. This is so nice to see everybody. I'll stop. Yeah, now. good to see you, David. So we would like to take a peek into your conversation. And um, if we can have the recorders uh, tell us your response to the last question, which was, what are a few things you were inspired to explore from David's conversation? You can, if you can put it in the chat and then just um, speak to it as well, unmute yourself and and tell us what you guys uh, left the meet your small group meeting with. Who would like to get started and share? Yeah, it looked like we had four rooms today, so. Mm -hmm. um, I can go, I was, I think I had the right, I'm Zane Bale, I can go with group two. Um, we had um, a great conversation and um, I'm just trying to find my notes again, but I think I have it um, and I'll get it pasted in, but we talked about being inspired to further explore the idea of culture change and how to um, get buy-in and bring people along and just kind of figuring out how to navigate that path. That was one thing. And then the other one that we all agreed on was the idea of being a learning organization and how important that is and to just really 
constantly ask questions and say, hey, you know, just because we've been doing it this way for a while doesn't mean it's a great way to do things and how we can just kind of integrate continuous improvement into our what we do. Thanks, Dane. And how about Andre? Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Andre. Yep. Andre. Okay. There I am. Um, yeah, I was sharing my screen and trying to type at the same time. So um, I'm a little uh, convoluted, but um, we talked about um, how wonderful it was, especially um, a couple of us have Claire as our program officers and being uh, so relational and um, um, responsive with funding um, and how, how helpful that was and how we can maybe look at funding things differently. Um, if we're holistic, we're not so focused on programs, but maybe um, um, bigger picture. Um, let's see um, how we can get more people like David um, to, to change some ideas in the, in the funding world. Um, there was some reticence about sharing dreams and, and um, kind of the crest of the wave and then the conversation about how can we listen to all voices um, that might be culturally different or look different um, and understand that these are trusted community voices and if we want to do things differently, we have to start listening differently. Um, so I, I don't know, anyone in our group want to add to what, what I what I said there. Okay. Thank you. And Claire. Yeah, our group um, talked about a bunch of questions. So I just put the one for the, the question you asked, Sherry. So our group was super diverse. We had Julie from Care Clinic, Veronica from Hispanics of Good Hue County, Belay from UCAP, and then African Community Services. So predominantly greater Minnesota groups. And one of the things that needs further exploration is how these are community led organizations and how do we move forward as the communities that we continue to serve continue to change. So for example, in African community services, they started with people when they were recently resettled, but now those folks call Minnesota home. So their needs have shifted and changed, yet they are still culturally meaningful and distinct. And so how do we continue to navigate with our communities on how best to serve them and be with them? Also, then we have this constantly changing situation with COVID. So it's time to examine who we are, where we are, what we need to do to really function given the changes within our community so we can keep staying connected and accountable. Great, thanks Claire. Throw your report out. And I think we've got, um, let's see, Jonathan. Sure, so um, when, uh, when we were kind of going down the list and um, were at the, what is the most exciting question, we kind of went right into, um, I think, kind of how, how all of our organizations and workers are really kind of feeling that, that, that burnout and that need for rest that, um, that makes you know, a, a stronger organization. Um, a few of the notes that we, we had um, that you know, holistic or organizations ideally encourage the idea of rest and self-care and recognize its value, but organizationally, there's just not much support for it. So how do organizations make that work? the pace and demand of work does not match the demand and expectation of the sector by and large. Um, is there a guilt factor that sort of precludes rest and recuperation for nonprofit employees and workers uh, when they believe the people that they are serving are indeed drowning? So does that kind of cancel out this idea of, well, I can't be at rest because the consumers I work with aren't, aren't um, succeeding or not at rest either. Um, in the context of that, then our own labor shortage does affect our ability to create um, rest or rest of moments. Uh, people are leaving the labor force, uh, but the, the labor still remains and is growing. Um, so how basically do we meet people's needs when we struggle to meet um, our own? Um, the, uh, what is one idea or concept that we wanted to share with coworkers? 
Um, and we kind of changed that to what can we bring to leadership because our, our general agreement was lots of our coworkers, um, people in our, our units, our divisions and departments are on the same page when it comes to this need for, for self-care in order to be a more effective uh, force in the agencies we work with. But developing ideas and concepts for self-care as real deliverables for a board or leadership um, to hopefully implement and integrate into organizational culture is really where um, those, those ideas need to, to go. And, and that's, that's where they need to be turned into, you know, into tangible outcomes that will hopefully you know, work their way down and, and improve uh, conditions for, for all the staff for our agencies. Great, thank you. Thanks everybody for letting us take a look into the small group conversation that you had. And David um, put a few things into the chat. Um, and I'm, David, do you wanna to speak to what you're sharing with the group? Yeah, I just was thinking, you know, as I was hearing the report outs, um, you know, there's an article for, for um, called, uh, I think I put it in there, is your organization surviving change or thriving in it and it was really some tips and tricks and support for you all to to help think and again it really goes in alignment with what you're talking about how do you um, cut down the uncertainty for your staff how do you make because again i think there's you know if we can't do less work then how do we make it clear what people are doing so they're not worried about things that they can't change so it's in there just thought i would share Great. Thank you, David. And I wanted to invite, I wanted to invite anyone who had maybe any late breaking burning questions for David. We, we uh, begged him and pleaded with him to stay longer so that uh, he'd still be available to you. But it, so if anyone has anything else that they want to um, ask or make sure gets in there, now would be a good time to do so. Okay, looks like we're done. We're done with you, David. No, just kidding. Um, if there yeah, is any- Maybe, not, maybe <laughs> yeah. not done, but just still trying to absorb everything, David. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. yes, we uh, uh, just let us know if there's, uh, if you want us to reach reach out to David for any, any reason. Um, afterwards, you have a shower moment, a driving moment, something like that. So, thank you. Yeah. And uh, Allison put something in the chat about uh, the NAP ministry. Um, if you're a follower there, it's all about uh, rest and some, you know, I follow them on uh, probably Instagram as well. So that's a really good resource as well. Yes, radical rest is a movement for sure. Right, yes. And people are talking about it just like we um, have today. I, I'm out to the next two slides. Uh, to who, Jennifer, does that make sense? If, great. Uh, sure. Oh, okay, great. Um, so, you know, we've been on a journey. Um, the first time that we met, um, we talked, we did a little show and tell, and we talked about evaluation. And then today, you guys let us know what sort of field perspectives would be helpful for you. And we, we had an opportunity to have David and to talk about innovation. And there's so much more that can be done there as well. And so in our next session together, we're interested in um, moving forward. What is it that we would continue to do? And we'll have a survey that we'll collect from you. Uh, as always, we wanna make sure that we're delivering to you what um, best works for you and is important to you. And we already have a date reserved for December 15th from noon to two, and you'll get an invitation to get that onto your calendar. So in an effort to improve our survey response rates, being, being evaluators, but also in an effort to prepare for the, the last meeting of the year, uh, we, we want to hear um, a little bit about how have these experiences been so far? And as we're thinking about moving forward, what would you like the December uh, session to include or entail? Uh, as uh, Tahoot mentioned, there's other affinity groups that also meet. Some of you participate in those, some of you do not, which is totally fine. 
you know, for some, they want their final session to be a planning session to get ready for next year. For others, they are um, more interested in maybe hearing from the field still or continuing to have um, experiences so much what we had today. And so we just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us, you know, what would you like December to focus on? Um, uh, sometimes we also, can we have it all? No, you can't have it all. No, of course. Uh, if, if there's lots of interest in having both things. And uh, some people have even told us they would like longer, uh, longer sessions. Um, some say, nope, the two hours is just right. So this is an opportunity for you to just, for us to get a little bit of a pulse check, see how we want to close out our pilot year and, or, um, and then uh, we can decide how to move forward, even if these kinds of topics even are resonating with you. So, um, so the link to the survey could be in the chat. You should be taking it now. You know, now is a good time um, to do so. And then I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask for those of you who are filling out the survey to just get, uh, to just uh, who feel comfortable to give us a little bit of a of a pulse check about how you're feeling about these holistic convenings. Uh, in a, um, 30 seconds, I'm going to give you the kind of work your way through some of the questions. And you can uh, raise your hand or do a reaction when you're finished, or if you've made it through the survey, you can let us know with some sort of reaction, like a clap your hands, give us a thumbs up, something like that. I'm not seeing any raised hands or any reactions, so you're still taking it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, as you're finishing up, um, who is willing to tell us a little bit about their thinking about, about the holistic group here? Um, any uh, thoughts about when we meet, we meet quarterly, the length of time, or some ideas that you'd like to see for, uh, for our December time together? Who's willing to take themselves off mute to share your two cents? I see some of you already off mute, Mr. Ron. I see Barty. Some of you are already off mute. Are you getting ready to speak? Oh, okay, Jennifer, since you called on me, if that was such a teacher move, like, holy crap. Okay. Um, so, uh, you, you know, the only, the only thing that I would just, I, I don't know that I have any other thoughts about meeting times or anything, but um, I, I just think that there has to be some acknowledgement that like, um, much of our systems, both state and philanthropic, do not support holistic services to children. The way the funding is, the way that uh, coordination across systems or supports. And I think for, you know, as an organization that is, is advocating at the Children's Defense Fund, for those who may not know, um, for those types of supports, right? We are confounded by the way in which money moves in, from all different spaces. In, and oftentimes the unpaid work for both the nonprofits that are doing this and for families is coordinating the system, right? In a holistic way. Cause like a kid is a kid or a family is a family, right? 
Right. And so I think maybe digging into that would maybe potentially be interesting, right? Um, uh, and I am also kind of reflecting on David's perspective on like the role of philanthropy versus the role of like, then what happens after like philanthropy has harvested those ideas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then, you know, I'm always interested in thinking a little bit about the underlying mental models of how we support people that in order to get help, I don't know, and in and order, and order to be a helper, like you are, need to both be controlled and then also wildly under-resourced because you should just be grateful for what you get. And I think that that actually also informs how nonprofit, we, I mean, we were talking about self-care and I was like, how, you know, all of us were like, wow, how does that happen? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, and maybe how to get a gaming room in every nonprofit or whatever, meditation room. We also talked about that, but just thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm sorry if you felt pressure. That was not my intention. Who else? How about one more? I'll just say I've been in many meetings with Barty where she says she's going to put on her teacher hat and call on people. So <laughs> That's why I appreciated it, Jennifer, because you went oh. right where I usually go. I see. Hold on. I see. Very good. One more, one more sharing. One more voice. Just one more voice and we can move on and be done. Well, since you keep asking for one more voice, I'm going to this thought about um, how do we help um, people understand that their voices are important because that's a little piece that came up in our conversation about um, sometimes the fear of sharing ideas for thinking that people are gonna think that we're you know um, off the wall crazy or that our idea is way out there or um, so maybe, some sort of support around how do we use those voices? Because to me, when I heard that, my heart hurt a little bit because I look into the community um, for what I would say are the expert voices because they aren't me. So it's the communities in which I'm serving where the people that I'm serving, I want their voices and I don't want them to be afraid to name anything um, is for me to try to understand what they're asking and hopefully be able to help with. So maybe something along that lines, I would like to see maybe for those of us as how do we ask people and invite them in to give their stories without them feeling like they think we might think that they're not worthy of sharing that voice. I don't know. I would just, a um, just a thought since you're asking for voices and nobody seems to want to talk because <laughs> they're probably all afraid to talk. So thank you for that. That's a, um, Helpful. Great. Okay. Well, we have your uh, anonymous thoughts, which is fantastic. And we have a closing quote here um, that we wanted to leave you with. Um, in the spirit of innovation, we're also, uh, we're also aware of the role creativity bring, uh, has in this. And so our, um, our gift to the world, Maya Angelou um, said once, uh, you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. And so we wanted to leave you with sort of a spirit of abundance. Um, and thank you for all, it is, all that you do and for being with us today. Until next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.